blessed. So very, very blessed. If you have your Bibles, open them to Hebrews chapter number 4. We are finishing up our spring series, though summer has come upon us. Spent the last 10 weeks talking about what it would look like, what it would mean to be a God pleaser. Now, if, you're a, if you've come to a place in time in your life that you knew that you had a need and that you had that sin and that sin separated you from a holy God and you knew that Christ had made a way, that he had gone to the cross of Calvary, substitutionally, he took your place. You uh, knew that and believed that he died on the cross, was buried, but three days later was, ro- that was risen from the grave. And now is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. If you've come to that place in time to know that that is who our Savior, our Lord, our Master, the God of the universe would reach down and do that for us, and you've repented of your sins and you've asked the Lord to come into your life, you pleased Him by accepting what He did for you. And you are a God pleaser. But that's the beginning. That's the beginning. Uh, All those years ago when I was born, um, That was uh, my life's beginning. It wasn't my life's conclusion. My story is still being written. And I sought to obey my parents. I sought to uh, follow their leadership. I sought to uh, come to uh, a place, and I did come to a place in time in my life to know that there was a God who loved me, and I gave my heart and life to him. And ever since then, I've been seeking to serve him. Some days, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, some days I served myself with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's been a process, and it's a growth thing. But I just want you to know that the Bible says very emphatically that you need to trust Him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that you need to trust Him by, through His grace, what He's done for you, and you need to receive it by faith. The Bible says very plainly in Hebrews 11.6, the only way that you're going to please Him is by living a life of faith. And I seek to do that. I seek to have a God life that's bigger than me, bigger than my circumstances, bigger than my understanding of God. I am at a place in time where I know that that, that God, His plan, His goodness, His kindness, and and it is so much beyond what I want and my thoughts, and I just yield my heart to Him every single day. I've got a great big God, and I know that my great big God can do all things, and and I know that he's bigger than my circumstances. So faith is having a great big God and having an action plan because of it, because faith is acting on the Word of God. Faith is facing the things in life, and because you you, you believe, not, not because you talk and say that you believe, but because you, you act on those beliefs. And trust trust God to be there. Sometimes acting means even standing still. Are y'all good with that too? Sometimes the greatest thing you can do is just do nothing and let God be God. But also when he says go, then you go. It begins in your heart and it works its way out. Faith is looking forward, not back. Not back. I mean, we look and we learn from our yesterdays and we meet God in our todays and we'll walk with him and what will become our tomorrows. But faith creates a faith outlook going forward. Grow from your yesterdays. Grow into your tomorrows. Here's the message for today. All this flows, all this talk of faith comes from an understanding of Christ You need to have your identity in Christ and in Christ alone. You need to view yourself the way God views you. You need to view your day the way God views your day. You need to view your circumstances the way God views your circumstances. And you've got to follow it all the way through to completion. He's not done with us yet. Y'all good with that? A farmer does not do all the work to plant the, to, to get the soil ready to plant it, to watch it grow, to do all of that, just to just leave it out in the field. 
there must also be a harvest. Can we say that it's not done? Uh, you've heard of the phrase, until it's all up in the barn. Y'all good with that? If you're watching a football game, if you're playing in something like that, they have two halves. And you may come out and have a great first half. You may be uh, just knocking the, the, the other team up backwards, and you may be scoring left and right, and everything may be going your way, and you may go into halftime and say, this has absolutely been wonderful. I'm tired. I don't want to do anymore. The game's not over at halftime. You've got to see it all the way through. If there's a circumstance in your life, and, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, this is what it is, and this is how we need to treat it, if you don't live out the health plan the doctor gives you, if you don't fill the medicine, if you don't do what he tells you to do, you're not there yet. You're not there yet. It's going forward to completion. There was a show when I was a kid, it's being syndicated and it's still playing on TV. If you can find it, you got some of those channels, they play it all the time. Maybe the younger people don't know what I'm talking about when I say this, but if it, any of y'all ever heard the Beverly Hillbillies? <laughs> Amen. The Beverly Hillbillies. One day Jeb was shooting for some food, and up from the ground came some bubbling crude. All that is. Y'all have seen that show, haven't you? There they lived in their backwards condition, poverty, hardship. But then something came and changed their life, and money was never a problem anymore. And, and all the friends told them that they had to leave and go to this place called Beverly Hills. And they, they, they got this great big mansion, but they took their hillbilly ways with them. You remember the cement pond? You remember, uh, though they were, they were there, they still lived like they used to. The old hillbilly ways were still in their heart. When we come to Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the children of Israel. And after 430 years of slavery... 430 years of, of someone else telling them what to do and crying out to God so that God would deliver them. God did exactly that. And he took them from the slavery in Egypt. And there was a promise that God had given to their forefather Abraham that went to his son Isaac and to Jacob. And all the way through the, 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 the children of Israel and they were there. The promise of God was there. And even after he delivered them from Egypt, he couldn't get Egypt out of their heart. Even to the point where it says that they, a, a 35-day trip took 40 years. An entire generation died in the wilderness. Because they, they said, you know, uh, we had leeks and onions to eat in Egypt. God help us. I believe I could feast on the land of milk and honey a whole lot better than that. Amen. But you see, though God wanted to give, it was the promised land. Amen. God had said it's yours but they couldn't get Egypt out of their hearts. They couldn't walk out the grace of God. God had given them the miracle, but they didn't see a great big God. They weren't looking for an action plan of following God and, and fulfilling the plans that he had for them. They wanted to just, Lord, just leave us alone and let us do what we want to do. Let us live in our poverty. Let us live below the grace line. Why did that happen? In Hebrews chapter 4, the writer tells us the story. Verse 1. You there? Say amen. You're not there? Look up on the screen. Therefore, since a promise remains, God's promise, 
of entering his rest. Can I just pause right there? How many of you like to have the Lord's rest? Anybody up for the Lord's peace? Anybody up for the Lord's love just overflowing you like a waterfall? Everybody, anybody want to see the goodness of God? Letting your eyes see the, the promise of his kindness? There's a promise that's there. We sing the song victory in Jesus, but we, do we want it and do we mean it? If God's given us that promise of blessedness, are we still living in, in, capta, in being encaptured by our own yesterday? He says, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. I don't want to come short of it. I want to walk it out. I want to get the full extent of it. I want to soak up every ounce of his goodness and his love and his kindness. I don't want to be the Beverly Hillbillies. Having the mansion but yet still living in the old way. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it, not being blended, not being ignited by faith in those who heard it. They were still living by sight. All they could see was the desert. And even when the spies went into the promised land and saw that it was exactly the way God explained it, all they could put their eyes on was the hardships, the walled cities, not on the promises of God, not on the grape clusters that you had to put a pole between two men to put the grapes on. To, wow. All they could see were the problems. What they saw was the shortcomings. What they saw is God being incomplete. God wasn't incomplete. They just couldn't see it. They were looking for it all to be given to them by sight and not ever having to walk it out by faith. The Bible in the New Testament talks about, now listen to me very quickly. I don't want anybody to be confused. I'm going to be talking in the next few moments about those people who have been wise enough to, to repent of their sins and give their heart and life to Christ. The believers, Christians, names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Y'all got me? Even then, the New Testament says there are two types of Christians. One are spiritual, those that are looking for everything to flow from Christ. They have it all in Jesus. They're not incomplete. They're, they're, they're fulfilling it day by day in Him. And the others, it uses two words, fleshly. Paul uses it like the word carnal. For today's sermon alone, can I call them Beverly Hillbilly Christians? You'll never hear another sermon like this one, I guarantee it. <laughs> having all the, the bounty, having all the blessings, having the mansion, having the goodness, but still living in the old fleshly ways. One seeks to follow Christ, the other looks and thinks like the old person. Both are made alive in Christ. Both are declared righteous by God. Both lack nothing except one is directed by the Spirit and the other is directed 
by the impulses of the old nature. And Hebrews 4.2 says, this came because it was not being mixed with faith. So both were free to choose the path to walk with Christ and seek the fruit of his glory. Yet one simply wanted to seek their own will and their own sinful activity which follows from it. One found their identity in Christ. One saw themselves the way God saw them. One simply chose to walk by sight and what they thought not by faith. So really, one is still beaten down by the world. The other is an overcomer in Christ. One, though they're a Christian, lives with none of the benefits of Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's sad. From time to time, they'll understand that and know that, and they'll, they'll actually seek more. So they may come to church for a while. They may pick up their Bible for a while. They may say, I need to pray more. They'll say, I need to fellowship with more Christian people and be with them. But then a circumstance will come up. Come on now. A circumstance will come up, and when that circumstance comes, they're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to choose to, to live this out in faith or am I going to keep doing what I've done before? It usually comes with an activity of temptation to either move into the uncomfortable and crucify the flesh and our will or simply to take the more easy path the one that we've taken so many times before, I can tell I'm starting to lose some of you. Let me, uh, let me bring you six words. Let's, let's take a test. Y'all like tests? No? Well, let's take one anyway. <laughs> there are some benefits from being the preacher. How many of you are following these characteristics in your life. I want you to let these words come in and see if you're ever troubled by them. Inferiority. Insecurity. Inadequacy. Guilt. Worry. Doubt. A named psychologist, Christian psychologist, got a group of 50 dedicated, come on now, dedicated Christians, conservative, Bible-believing Christians, and ask these 50 people how many of them had these following characteristics in their life. I'm going to say them to you again. Insecurity, inferiority, inadequacy, guilt, worry, or doubt. All 50 said they had all six in their life. Do we have a problem with the understanding of who we are in Christ? How many, don't raise your hand. This is not about that. How many of you felt insecure? The bills are hard. Life's hard. Inadequate. I know other people can do those things, but I'm, I'm just, I just don't feel. Inadequate. 
inferior. It bothers me that our children feel this way. It bothers me that, that they, go, they have to go to the playground and feel inferior to somebody else or somebody's dressed differently and they feel inferior or somebody made a hundred on the spelling test so the other one felt inferior or inadequate or somebody they don't they don't have a good home they don't know so they, they feel insecure they don't feel loved It bothers me that our children feel that way. Can I say, can, amen? amen? But it bothers me that adults still feel that way. How many adults, adults still battle guilt when the forgiveness of God is there? How many worry when Jehovah Jireh is on the throne. How many of them are still dealing with doubt? Though Jesus has never lost a battle. That he is the great I am. And you're a child of God. You are loved. You are held in the hand of God. You were fashioned and informed exactly the way he wanted you. He knew you while you were in the womb. You're not a mistake. God doesn't make junk. Yes, you chose sin. Your nature was to sin. But God cleansed you from your sin when you accepted Christ into your life. And by faith, you need to receive it. My dad is rich. My dad is able. And my dad loves me. And if I'm spoiled, nana nana boo boo. <laughs> Amen? As a grandparent, I am learning that it's all right to spoil your grandchildren. Not you, Jay. I had that job with you. Now you got it with Evangeline. When you're a parent, you have to teach, right? The job of a parent is to make yourself uh, where you, you work yourself out of a job. Amen? To teach them that there is a father who loves them. Grandparents, we just get to love them. Uh, by the way, let, there's, there is a phenomenon, and, and I, I need to say this, there is a phenomenon that's happening in our country where grandparents are raising grandchildren. And, and, and tr trust me, I'm not saying anything about that. I, the Lord is my witness. A few weeks ago, a, a close friend of mine had a baby. She's only 63. It's her great-granddaughter. And I said, Lord, help, not, real, not again. She said, yes. Looks like she's going to be raising the great-grandchild great as well. I understand that. But I, I, and, and that would make a person feel inadequate, wouldn't it? The child. That would make them feel insecure. But I have a heavenly Father that loves me. I'm going to say these words to you again. Inferiority. Inadequacy. Insecurity, guilt, worry, doubt. Now I'm gonna. How many of those affect you? This is not the time to lie to yourself. We got a bunch of worry warts. If there was an Olympic event. For a person sitting in a chair and churning inside, America would win gold medal every time. Matter of fact, we could win gold, silver, and bronze. We got some Olympic 
Olympi Olympians in here could do that. Uh, worriers. Doubters. Guilt-ridden. I wonder how many of us would say, if we were honest, how many of us would say, five out of five, six out of six? All of them. I'm just going to say, we, we've spent ten weeks talking about faith. We've, been, we've spent ten weeks and just scratched the service, surface of a God being there who is adequate, who will be your security. And there is nothing that can overcome him. He has freed you. He has cleansed you. And hear these words from the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In this room, there are some people that have reached an age. And you may have spent the last 60, 70 years not fear, fearful, but now you're fearful. You may have never felt alone, but now you feel alone. This is the time to find your identity in Christ. You're not second rate. You haven't missed out. But you're only going to find this by faith. You're going to have to move all over away from sight. You're going to have to accept this new path that's before you. And you're going to have to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You're going to have to say, no matter what, God's bigger. You're going to have to let the healing come from the inside out. You may have to search for Christ. You may have a circumstance and you don't see God anywhere in there. I say stop and look and you'll find him. Matter of fact, one of our things in America that we love to do is we love to see other people making mistakes and critiquing them and criticizing them. We love to do that. It makes Satan very happy when we do that. I think we just need to stop, pause, and say, Christ, what can I do to make that better? How could I be useful? How could I be used? They're loved just as much as we are. So let's take our inadequacy, our insecurity, our inferiority, our doubt, our worry, our guilt. Let's lay them down. Let's accept what God would have us to have. Let's go home to heaven trusting in the great big God, trusting that he could use us, trusting that he would bless us. Don't stop looking for him in the situation and the circumstance until you see him there. When you see him, act on it. It's an exciting life. You might have a few red seas to cross. There may be some battles at Jericho. And you may be scared going in, but there's a great big God. And if you'll walk it out by faith, some of you may have some crosses to bear. Matthew 16 says we need to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Do it by faith. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I pray. Lord, we've spent 10 weeks talking about faith. I pray that we quit talking about faith and start acting on faith. Acting upon who you are. Lord, if there's someone in this building today that does not know you as Savior and Lord, I pray that they have the courage to repent of their sins, have the wisdom to believe in you and the faith to reach out and ask you to do for them what only you can do. Lord, I, 
I pray that they will give their heart and life to you. Ask you to save them. Lord, you're a promise keeper. And we're going to hold you to your word. But Lord, I know this room is also filled with people who are already Christians, but they're living way below the grace line. Lord, like those 50 who had to say that all six of those things affected their life. There are many in this room, though they are born again, they're still troubled by worry, doubt, and fear, and guilt. Lord, help us to see who we are in Christ and accept that and to begin to walk it by faith. Oh God, do a healing work in our midst. You're the only one who can. Lord, you, found, you have found a needy people. That's who we are. So Holy Spirit, show out. Every time one of these people want to grab hold of you and to live a new, better life in Christ, seeing who they are, Lord, meet them there. Set them free by the power of the Holy Spirit to live this Christ walk. Lord, let it begin today. Let it begin in me. May we be promise keepers too. Lord, this invitation I give to you, Holy Spirit, you're the only one who can give it well. Use it, speak to hearts. May there be healing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.